It was shifty business. A very shifty business. All the queens of crime were curiously very much accepted by the aristocratic intellectuals of England. And they all read Nio. I think they're rather like crossword puzzles of the highest order. Crime fiction is a huge genre, and on any given week, the top ten bestsellers, four or five or perhaps six of them, will be crime in some shape or form. Although it has changed radically in the last 20 years, and it has changed out of all recognition from the time that Agatha Christie and Nio Marsh were writing. Nio Marsh's reputation will be seen as up there with Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers and her contemporaries from the Golden Age. Man Lay Dead, your first book, my first case. Chief Inspector Detective Allen was accosted by Detective Boys in the corridor outside his office. What's the matter with you, said Inspector Boys. Has someone found your job? <laughs> You've guessed my boy's secret. I've been given a murder to solve. And I'm a lucky little detective. There's no doubt that at the time that she was being published originally, Nio Marsh ranked as, as one, of the, one of the top crime writers in the world. I mean, the, the 1930s changed the face of crime publishing in that suddenly the most famous and most successful authors were women. Nio Marsh, when she was first published in paperback, had a million copies printed and published. And this was something that really had only been done for a couple of authors up until that point. And here we are, 25 years plus since Nio Marsh died. And her books have stood the test of time. They are all still in print. They have been ever since she died, which is no mean feat in itself these days. It's actually 75 years since A Man Lay Dead her first book was published. And we wanted, as NIO's publisher, to do something special to help commemorate that. And we hit upon the idea of, rather than republishing 32 completely separate books, let's put them together in a series of omnibuses. Oh. <laughs> I wonder what you have to say about me, ma'am. He was born with the rank of Detective Inspector CID on a very wet Saturday afternoon in a basement flat off Sloan Square in London. The year was 1931. Then she writes, I read a detective story and I remember idly wondering if I had it in me to write something in the genre. I beat my way to a stationer's shop, bought six exercise books, a pencil and pencil sharpener and splashed back to the flat. That was the season in England when the murder game was popular at weekend parties. I thought it might be an idea for a whodunit if a real corpse was found. As we know, these weekends of mine have acquired a certain reputation for their uh, dramatic quality. And in that pleasurable tradition, I propose that this weekend we play murder. And she continues. Then I thought about the character who had already begun to take shape. A man with a background resembling the friends I had made in England, who could be equally at home in the Antipodes. I discovered that I knew quite a lot about him. My detective would be a professional policeman. He came in without introduction, and for me at least, he was, and is, very real indeed. And now, Dame Nio, it is perhaps time to discover the real you. Detective Inspector Roderick Allen. Hi, I'm Joe Drayton. Good to meet you. How do you do? In person at long last. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Joe, what do you do? I'm a writer. Actually, a biographer of Nia Marsh. So Roderick Allen has been a major feature in a lot of what I've done. So it's, it's quite a Oh, that's extraordinary. In fact, it was on the banks of the Avon River when I first met Nia Marsh. Really? Right here? Yes. Well, it, it, was, it was a mystery play and it was done outside. I went to the changing rooms afterwards. Mm. 
I was only eight, and all of a sudden this amazing woman walked into the room, and my mother said, well, she's one of those sort of women. And I thought, what on earth is one of those sort of women? And of course, when she came in with this booming voice and this amazing theatrical flair, I thought, that is what one of those women is. But in I fact, see. one of those sort of women is rather more difficult to define than I originally thought. Everyone on stage, please. A lot of her novels feature the theatre in some shape or form. And she obviously has ones that are set almost exclusively in the theatre. Vintage Murder, Opening Night, uh, Death at the Dolphin, Light Thickens. I mean, they're imbued with the theatre. But a lot of her other novels, they may not feature the traditional theatre, but they do feature a performance of some sort. So, for instance, Off With His Head is Morris dancing and murder during a Morris dance. Um, and even to stretch a point, the nursing home murder is set in an operating theatre. So she never really strayed very far from the theatre in some shape or form. Who's there? I wrote my first play when I was, uh, I was about 10, I think. And I did it with little cousins on a stage in the bay window of their house. And it was um, called with great originality, Cinderella. <laughs> And um, the only bit I really remembered at all, well, I was the fairy godmother. Uh, was Cinderella discovered when the curtain went up among the ashes. And she was saying, oh dear, oh dear, what shall I do? Of balls, I've been to such a few. Just once I've seen that handsome prince, and I've never seen him since. <laughs> 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 it went on. And it was very good indeed, and a great success six members of our respective families that saw it. Your beloved Martin Cottage. How do you do? How do you do? I'm Detective Inspector Roderick Oh, hello. <laughs> nice to meet you, because I've been typing you for years. Come on in and have a cup of tea, do. when you were transcribing the characters. Did you ever get caught up in their lives and their stories? Yes, yes, I did. I thought you were a super chap. Really? You were very, well, desperately reliable. You'd have to be in that job, but you had a wonderful sense of humor, and you had a very nice wife, Troy, and you, you were just a very, very nice, intelligent man. I think anybody who had you on his case would probably feel that way. Time to meet the New Zealanders in your life. There'd be about six or eight people, yeah. and uh, the evening started with um, white ladies in the drawing room, and um, that was a pretty powerful cocktail, and uh, she was a generous hostess, and by the time everybody would had two or three of those, if not more, Everybody was well away by the time they arrived at the dinner table, so conversation uh, was never a problem. And this was your job? I kept the glasses filled, which has never been difficult for me. <laughs> <laughs> Did she have a, a sense of style of her own, though? Was it particular? Oh, very much. She was a very sh chic, elegant, yes. beautifully dressed woman. Yes, often in black. She had Dior dresses she was very proud of, and she looked wonderful. Explosion any moment. There we are. Oh, oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, may I propose a toast to the reason we're all here? Right. Oh, yeah. In the memory of Dame Naya Marsh, God bless her. Dame Naya. Dame Naya. Dame Naya. Cheers. Cheers. I'm getting beef for Auckland. Oh, I thought you might have told you. She says the theatre was her drug, and in fact, she wrote in order to support her habit. Yes. Yes. There's no doubt that she found the theatre in enormously engaging and created the substitute family that's represented around this table, I think. But she probably did put far more heart into her box than people realised. Yeah. I remember her talking about how you could wait all day for inspiration to come. She really did gruel it out. Many of the novels, of course, have theatrical settings yes. and theatrical people in them. Mm. But it's a sort of hyper-theatrical mm. world which we now find ridiculous. But for her, had a reality. Yeah. And I'm, mm. I'm afraid we've all met people who would fit very comfortably <laughs> into an I.O. Marsh <laughs> novel through <laughs> ego and self afflation <laughs> But you know, I can't think <laughs> anybody at this table. No. Would, no. 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 But um, it was a rather fruity mm. period of really formulated mm. in the twenties mm. and thirties of a certain showy type of theatrical life. Yes. You know, 
women taking off their fur coats and dragging them along the floor just to show how <laughs> those, those were the days. <laughs> 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 those were the days. <laughs> I was an only child um, who really, I think, probably wished she had brothers and sisters, but um, wasn't blessed with another sibling. And this is Rose Elizabeth Seeger, Nio's mother. Rose was the daughter of Edward Seeger, and he had a really interesting background because he was not only the uh, first governor of the Littleton Jail, but also the first superintendent of what was then called the Sunnyside Lunatic Asylum. And he was a remarkable man because not only did he have the criminology background, but he used members of his family to use drama as therapy. He used mesmerism and he used amateur theatricals. And so Nio's mother, Rose, was very early introduced to theatre, magic lantern shows and all sorts of things like that. We need to go back to those times when the bond between New Zealand and England was very strong. The Marshalls were, were English people. Christchurch is an English city. They kept saying to themselves, we're not Englishmen, we've got to somehow become New Zealanders. How do you become a New Zealander? And somebody had the right idea, look, we'll give our children uh, Maori names. The problem was solved. <laughs> and again, that's meant about becoming Englishmen. Tui, Nairi, Rata, Nio was a good name because it meant bright, clever, luminous as well, of course, as being a tree, um, uh, the name of a tree. And so she was christened Edith Nio Marsh. I couldn't possibly pronounce NG, so I called her Nagio. And we all adored her. I was absolutely hell-bent on becoming a good painter when I left school. I went to the School of Art here and I was a student for about five years and uh, got a certain way with it. A woman of serious talent, ma'am. This hangs on the dining room of the house where Naya used to come and stay. She must have sat round there on the front veranda and painted, because this was the single shepherd's cottage here. It was set back on that green patch, just back in the trees. And I understood that um, dyed in the wool was also thought about here, and so she obviously mixed with the shepherds. Come on, let's have some of that wool out. The parents were both very interested amateur actors. In fact, I think Henry and Rose met in the context of repertory production. It's very interesting. This is three of them on stage, Mrs. Marsh, Nio, and her father, Henry. As she said, there was always a plate award in my family. Most unexpectedly, I was asked, invited by the Alan Wilkie to join his company. And I think I'd come to the end of my tether in the School of Art Christchurch. I think I'd, I'd gone as far as I could go there. And the, all, the theatre was always an absolute passion with me, even at that age. That really impacted, I think, having a mother who was a thespian. Now, Nye always said with great pride that her mother had entirely the professional attitude to acting. And then I produced two or three really very big ventures for a girl of that age, two or three musical shows in the old Theatre Royal. And in addition to that, with my great friends, um, the Tahu Rhodeses, I, I, we formed a little touring company that went round and did things for charity called Touch and Go. She met Tahu when she was young, living in Fendleton, and the family had a house and, and were renting. The Marshes had a house on the opposite side of the street. And that's where they met. So Naya would have played with Tahu in the grounds here. Tahu Rhodes' sister actually went to St Margaret's College with Naya. But the real connection to Tahu and Nelly Rhodes began when they worked together. And I suppose it was a bit of a Lewis Carroll experience. There's an absolute sort of mind-locking uh, of uh, 
not the two, but the three. They were inseparable. Naya herself was an actress all the way through her life, and she was fascinated by Luigi Pirandello's play from the 1920s, Six Characters in Search of an Author. And she produced it later on in her career. What that play is about is a group of characters who invade a rehearsal of actors and immediately insist that they have a validity which must be expressed, that their story is important and that actors should act them out. Now, I'm, I'm a little bit intrigued that, in a sort of way, you as, as Roderick Allen are, in a sense, the reality. Thank you, Mr. Dolly. <laughs> the imposter. It's the theme of life as theatre and mask. In asking you to come together here, I'm taking an unorthodox step. A criminal is, in her fiction, very often a performer, and he, his whole uh, mechanism is disguise. And I truly believe that that was her view of life, Shakespeare's view. Life, all the world's a stage, and we are merely players. Hence my love of the bard. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. This was the rehearsal, and we'd never known he was going to be coming out of Shakespeare. That was it. At his heels, leashed in like hounds. But it's playing the king that night. This is you. That was. <laughs> Tell me about that. Well, never had any acting experience before that at all. It was all brand new stuff. And Naya had taught about, you know, coming up on stage and everything and um, feeling the steps and the brick wall as one walks up on stage because one's in the castle or wherever it happens to be on the, on a, in the field of Agincourt. So that when one walks on stage, one is the king and not the actor. She wrote saying, I'd love you to come and play chorus in Henry V, and I've got this, I think, brilliant idea, which I personally have never seen done since mm -hmm. uh, or before, of having chorus played by William Shakespeare. You spent quite a bit of time with Nio. Yes, I knew her well. My first introduction to her was actually in this hall in Julius Caesar when I was a young starry-eyed student. What impressed me at the first rehearsal in here was the speed with which she worked. She had the scenes all worked out in her mind. Dame Nia, these must be exciting days for you, a new theatre, a new production. Yes, couldn't be more, sir. We've waited for 15 years for it. Well worth Wonderful waiting for. Well worth it, yes, rather. But you know, it doesn't feel new to us now. We've been working in it for three, six weeks, nearly seven now. And it's lost all that sort of raw sawdust and paint feeling altogether. It really feels like a playhouse now, workhouse. Lovely. This was the theatre in which I played Puck for Nio. She asked me to come out from England when I'd been in the professional theatre for a while, and she said, you better come and play it before arthritis sets in. And, of course, it was one of her famous student productions. And it had an amazing cast, in retrospect. There was people like Sam Neill and so on. But this theatre is dedicated, really, to the work that she did with students. She was the one who had the guts to do Shakespeare at a time when people just thought he was posh, out of fashion. Um, writer in this city. She said to me rather quietly one day, would you like me to correct any accent problems? Because in her view, any New Zealander coming to England had to play the English at their own game. And so we'd be sitting at breakfast and I would say, um, would you pass the salt, please? And she'd say, I beg your pardon? Uh, would you pass the salt, please? Of course. And so little things came up. It makes me sound like a, a puppet, but, and I certainly wasn't. But I wanted to learn to be acceptable there in the profession. And the same applied to Elric Cooper, the same applied to James Lawrenson. If the New Zealand accent comes a bit too strong, I can hear now going, no, the lady's name is Helen James, not Helen. <laughs> I was working that, sorry, New Zealand, that's unfair. She was a very great teacher. I think she taught very simply, and she taught me some of the really basic things about performance. You know, about holding the stage and 
the way to speak to an audience, how to address the little boy in the back row who had spent his sixpence. She was really interested in presentation of, well, it's her painter's eye, of course. She saw actors, in a way, as moving pictures. And she instilled in us all that integrity to the text and to the audience. And she had this joyousness in performance and got it out of her students. And her productions had that energy which is you know, overflowing like a great tsunami of, of, of joy. You were one of Maya's boys, weren't you? I mean, there were a, a couple. I guess there was, yes. There was yourself, Jonathan Nelson, mm. Elric Hooper, mm. and Sam Neill. Mm. Did that feel special to you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess deep down inside you felt really very proud mm. and rather privileged. Was I, too, one of your boys? The other detectives of the period, like Poirot and um, Whimsy, they're all slightly eccentric. You are a very normal detective. The detective she created was, in fact, the man that I observed time and time, and again, my Nio found sexually attractive. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. in fact, that this was a yes. pin-up boy, really, yes, <laughs> yes, who yeah. had the sexual... Yep. Um, allure. allure and s sent out the whatever those rays are <laughs> that <laughs> turned women on. And, um, but it was done in a really patrician, upper class way, which was what you, Naya really found sexy. Do you think Tahu Rhodes might have been a, a, a part of the amalgam of what became our friend here? They were known as Tahu and Yahoo, <laughs> some, some <laughs> sort of. Before my time, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> Naya actually had quite a reputation in Christchurch when she was in her early 20s. Mm. Um, and I remember being told by somebody, oh, but she and Tahu Rose were, had such a reputation, they used to dance on the tables. Mm. And of course were rumours that they had an affair, because Christchurch is a very gossipy little place. The Rhodes had a huge impact on Io, just massive. I think she described it as a sort, sort of something like a fireworks going off in her life. <laughs> because they, they had so much money, social position, right. but they were fun, they were wild, they were crazy. Was it the, the Rhodes who introduced her really to travelling? Do you think? Well, yeah, absolutely. They returned to the UK and they sent Naya this invitation to join them. This was the first door to an adventure that just kept, kept on unfolding. Uh, there's a thing called the London feeling. You get up one morning, you go out into the street, and suddenly there's an extraordinary buoyancy, and you feel an enormous liking for everybody. I, 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 there's nothing like it, but I like the London feeling. That I understand. She was taken to Audible Manor, which rambled on, I think, 25 bedrooms it has. It was the end of the 1920s, all that excitement of the end of the First World War, and so they were much more free, in a way, with money, with their notions of relationships. She talked about the third sex, these women who were dressed as men, you know, who sat round wonderfully wealthy and would um, sometimes live in a kind of marriage with, a, with another, with a, with, a, with a femme. It was never made plain who she made love to. And there is no evidence because what Nio did as she got older and older was to chuck everything into the rubbish bin. It reminds me very much of in between the wars, lesbians who became friends because the men had died out. All that I can really believe is that she fell in love with the family, the Lampreys, otherwise known as the... The Rhodes. Quiet. They went into London and they go to the theatre and then after that they go out to a nightclub and they might go to several nightclubs and they'd party all night. So it was a wild, exciting, amazing time. I wonder, how was that for a young girl from the colonies? Along came the slump. They were beginning to feel pinch and had five children to educate. And there and then we took a little lock-up shop in the Brompton Road. 
and overnight we found ourselves vastly creators. They get these beautiful gilt books and take the uh, leaves out and turn them in, into waste paper baskets. That was one they sold very well. Her mother arrived from New Zealand and saw this wild, slightly bohemian, definitely dodgy, um, frivolous, as she saw it, life that Naya was leading with the roads, and wanted to nail down the edges definitely on her daughter and focus Naya back on the, the notion of her writing and back on her interest in serious theatre. Naya and her mother took a flat just, interestingly though, just round the corner from the roads. And it was in that little basement flat that she wrote A Man Lay Dead. It was probably the roads and the worlds that they lived in and their eccentric natures and their wonderful generosity that filled the book with the spirit and the information, the bodies, the locations, and in fact created Alan. I'm trying to establish how it was possible for the murderer to leave his or her room, come down here, kill Mr Rankin and then return so quietly unobserved in a very short space of time. Oh, it's horrible. Sing out when you're ready, Mr. Parthgate. She thought England was home. She always called it home with a big H. But she can't quite get it right when she herself comes to England because she, she has this weird notion about the English aristocracy, which... I've been born into a night of and so on. Um, and she doesn't get it quite right. The clink of the teacups, the uh, spindling of the spoons uh, are not quite accurate. Um, but what, you, what can you go on if you haven't been born into it? Well, anything else you haven't told me? You know that Ross couldn't have murdered Charles. She really loved him. Well, I'm sorry, Troy, but in my experience, love is a very powerful motive for murder. You can tell instantly that she was involved with the Bloomsbury Group. And, in fact, one of the things that I loved most about her when I read about her life was that she had a cat, because she had a suite at the Savoy, I think, and she used to take it out for walks on a lead. And I remember thinking, this woman has Bloomsbury written all over her in the way that I love. One of the fascinations in writing about her, I think, is the way that she recreated herself um, when she came to, to England and she lived a totally different life. And she was a kind of chameleon in that way that she dressed very stylishly, she stayed in the best locations, she shopped in Harrods and got her clothes from Hardy Amos. She was a totally different person than the person who used to stay in Christchurch and poke around her garden in her old clothes. We would never refer to her as a Kiwi that, at the time. Mm. I remember her saying at one point how she loved coming back here because you would have posh lunches at Foyles and they'd treat her rather famously. Whereas New Zealand's kind of sense of democracy, perhaps she didn't get that same kind of treatment, mm. um, which she, she enjoyed, the fact that she could be just be a person and not have posh lunches. Egalitarian, I guess it is, mm. at, at home. Um, whereas this country is blighted with its class system. We went to a play in the West End. After the matinee, we were walking back along the Strand, and she said, Simon, that's a terrible tie you're wearing. She said, I'm going to give you a tie. We were going past the men's outfitters. So we went in, and she said in that extraordinary voice, Now, darling, I will choose a tie. There were two male shop assistants who looked at each other as if to say, what have we got here? I mean, I was 20 and Naya was 60-something. Naya clearly caught their look. And she said, I think not just a tie, a shirt, socks, underpants, everything. The one thing my grandmother 
always wanted to do before she died was go 100 miles an hour. So Nio took her in that black Jaguar coupe and they went up there beyond Colverton, up that long Balmoral Strait, and they did 100 miles an hour for my grandmother, who was about 95 years old at that time. And that's two racy dams. Everything about her life would have been easier if she had moved back to the UK or even moved to America. But in fact, New Zealand and Christchurch is her Turanga Waiwai, it's her mm. homeland. Mm. And mm. she maintained a connection to that. And it, it, this is the one issue that really rips my ration book. <laughs> 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 because, in fact, it's a whole misrepresentation Absolutely. of the yes. woman. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She was a New Zealander through and through. This is crucial in her attitude towards language, which was the thing she was most criticised for. Um, she didn't want everybody to talk posh, but she wanted people to speak with the vigour and emotional freedom that comes with a real use of language. And really, when she was on about things, she didn't want the mean type, the small New Zealand <laughs> voice, yeah, particularly. And she was dealing with Shakespeare, Shakespeare. Yes. with whom mm. the musical yes. element, the actual sounds that you make, even if you don't understand English, should be able to move you. She looked to her place of origin as a Pākehā New Zealander. And returned to it, didn't she? Constantly, yes, both in her writing, her yep. setting of her books, yes. and the fact that whenever she went to England, she really longed to return eventually, although she missed London greatly. You worked with Naya for a very long time, didn't you? Yes, a long time, 20 something years, but she kept popping off to England. I think she went on about eight trips to London, and she'd always go by boat, and I would just hold the fort here but uh, it was always quite a long time. Whenever she went away to England, she used to do some trip, and I used to think, now nah, I wonder if that's going to be the setting for a book. And very often, I was right. <laughs> for me, one of the really important aspects of Naya Marsh is the settings, which in many cases are, are completely unique. I'm thinking particularly of Colour Scheme, which is set in a hot springs in New Zealand, and the hot springs are put to good use as a murder method. Um, the sheep farm for Died in the Wool, which is again is unique. Hercule Poirot or Peter Whimsey never visited a sheep farm, oddly enough. Alan was public school, highly educated. I particularly liked Alan. He wasn't your plodding policeman. Mm. He was a gentleman detective, if you like, but in the police force. How did you feel about being asked to play Alan? Inspector Allen is a person who happens to be a detective. And that's much easier to play, in a way. Come up here! And much more enjoyable, because you're playing a, a very firm character. Are the rest of the lodge party still at the Marai? Only Barbara and Mrs. Clare, and I sent them home. But we'd better go and see who's missing, Mr. Bell. When I first came to England, Nio employed me because I trained as a, a reporter on the Christchurch Star, so I knew how to type, which was an advantage, and I used to type her letters for her. And there were those wonderful times when I had to say that she was not available, so I was writing on her behalf. And Nio would say, Simon, make an honest woman of me, and she'd go into the next room and shut the door. And then back she'd come and off we'd go again onto a new book. She always wrote at night because she liked to have uninterrupted time. I'd come in about, oh gosh, I don't know what time it was, morning anyway. So she usually had a, a dollop of stuff for me to do. It was always so interesting and I used to so love her characters who she'd make. You got to know them well and some of them you got fond of. They were brilliant. There was one particular character that you didn't want to see the end of. Is that right? Yes. Yes, I said to her, now, um, if you're going to murder him, I'm afraid I'm not going to type this book. <laughs> but he wasn't on the list anyway, so that was all right. There was a lot of um, rewriting here, you see, the whole bit there. I got very fed up with rewrites because I used to think, well, I'm very stupid because I can't work out what she was at. 
And then when I came to type, retype, I realized, well, I really wasn't too terribly stupid. It's because with the rewrites, a whole lot of stuff had gone in, which I didn't know about. So, um, no, she did quite a lot of rewrites. She was very thorough. She always wanted to get it absolutely right. Swiftly, silently. No, you had to shut herself off and imaginatively create a definable world, a sparkling world of civilization, of humanity, and tolerance, and yet at the same time, intolerance for what she used to call the unique crime, the unique outrage, homicide. I think of a group of people nearly always, and because I write detective fiction, I've got to involve one of them in a crime of violence. And I've got to say to myself, well, which of these people is capable of a crime of violence, and under what circumstances might it come about? Niall would be seen as a very stylish writer, probably a better stylist than, certainly, than Agatha Christie, but not as good a plot technician as Agatha Christie. I would love to be able to write like her and write detective stories. It's the incredible dialogue that she has, that sort of sense of bang, 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 bang. Also, the descriptions of the natural landscape, the mud pools, the hills. I can see that actually that had seeped in to the sort of books I write. So I think there was an unknown influence that I've only just noticed. The landscape is a character, but it's not about the landscape. And whether it's the backstage of a theatre, you can smell that old musty curtain that comes down in opening night. You know, you know what that would be like, but it's not the point of it. It's just the texture of her writing that underlies the story. Into your dressing room, prepare for the curtain call. Ben, you need powdering. Take care with your lips and chin. You are dripping with sweat. Her acute ability to observe people, uh, London life, uh, the street life around of the Cockneys, or the theatre land, the club land of Mayfair, these kinds of things which later percolated into the books. Her extraordinary sense as a p trained painter with a very, very visually acute sense of, 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 of uh, design and colour and movement and shade. These all, these all come through. They make the book so eminently dramatisable, I think. You've got to get that mystery right. And, you know, beyond that, it's about how you embellish the story. And Nio was extremely good at detail. I mean, her books are... I mean, they're sometimes described as being the, the, the literary face of, of crime fiction. But also, you know, she delivers some beautifully gruesome murders. The maximum therapeutic dose for this drug is 100 milligrams. Ben got about two grams on his sweaty lower lip. Some of her more memorable killers, well, I would think of Kitty from Scales of Justice, but Scales of Justice is the typical golden age little English village murder mystery where there is huge rivalry about the fishing rights and a wonderfully vicious murderer is revealed in the last chapter. Quite memorable, Kitty, and she hadn't really been in the running up to that. If we were to find out who did this terrible thing... Couldn't we do this in the morning? Gerald. There are some questions I should ask now. Wild memories are freshest. And Overture to Death, wonderful picture of female jealousy with two middle-aged women fighting in a very ladylike manner over the local vicar. And, and it is also a very, very good detective plot. And another example of Niall Marsh's wonderful imagination with murder methods, because the, the victim is killed when she presses the loud pedal on the piano, which triggers a gun mechanism in, in amongst the hammers, which is unique in, in detective fiction and probably unique full stop. When Niall had to carry out a murder in her box, who did she go to? The surgeon. And my father can remember my grandfather, a brilliant surgeon, sitting at the top of the table, Nio sitting there, and in the middle of the meal, Nio says, now, Hugh, we have to murder this person as the lift's coming, lift is coming down three stories. How are we going to do it? And he said, no, there is only one way, and that's with a long metal meat skewer straight through the iron into the brain. Pretty rough stuff. Scotland Yard used to say that of all the great writers, women writers, really, of the period, she was the one who got her murders and her poisons and her means of death absolutely right. So I was flying off to Washington, D.C. on behalf of the farmers in New Zealand, walked into the bookshop in Christchurch and booked my, got my reading material for on the aeroplane, and I picked up this book, The Surfeit of Lampreys, and there on the front cover is the man on the lift with this long metal meat skewer 
through the eye and into the brain. And then you turn over two pages, and what does it say? For Sir Hugh and Lady Ackland with my love, for the one since he has helped me so often with my stories, and the other since she likes stories about London. That gory, horrible, ugly murder was set in Eaton Mansions, and of course the lampreys are in fact the roads. So that was so she was using the family and using this place here in the heart of, of her Knightsbridge. 1949 saw the release of The Marsh Million, as it became known as, releasing a million paperbacks on the one day. Ten titles and 100,000 copies of each. So the first writer was George Bernard Shaw, closely followed by H.G. Wells, and then the first crime writer was Agatha Christie, closely followed by Niall Marsh. You get to the 1950s and she's absolutely at the top of her game and everybody read her, both in the UK and, and internationally. It was amazing to have achieved that for a New Zealander and for anybody. Who and else in New Zealand yeah. was earning their living yeah. from right. writing? No, there you have it. With no, else. With no, else. No. No. If a book was selling well, I can remember saying, oh, what bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, I'm sorry to hear that <laughs> because it meant tax everywhere. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And she'd say, the book, this <laughs> book is apparently going like a rocket. Oh, I'd say, what a damn bad luck. <laughs> if she'd agreed to live in America, she'd be a very rich woman. Mm. Mm. Agatha Christie was the same. She had the same horrendous tax issues. Yes. It seemed like um, they, 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 these crime fiction writers, they ended up paying for the World War II, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they, 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 they were taxed so vigorously. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I don't think it was the money that no. drove her to no, the no, no. at all. No, but it was a way of um, making a living yeah. and in and, and a way that um, a sort of middle class or, or upper middle class, as she would have kind of exp aspired to be, mm. could make it. And make it decently and yeah. do, it, do it so yeah. it was sort of invisible. It was kind of, yeah. she did it at night quietly and mm. it was sort of an invisible way of, of earning a living that was yeah. acceptable. Well, she was quite prepared to run the shop in Beecham <laughs> Place, you know, <laughs> but she was a boss shop, but she was still prepared to run it. She was living with her material. There's nothing <laughs> as extraordinary as the Rhodes family that you speak about. <laughs> These sort of exotic blooms in the middle of the Canterbury Plains behaving <laughs> as if they were at Hedlow Hall or something like that mm. and and mm. it, Nellie Rhodes who was her great friend who I knew later was a wonderful old decayed aristocratic trout <laughs> who lived at, <laughs> at, at you know yeah. lived at West Malling. She you would love going there for sherry oh. here she would sit among mouldering cushions with a cigarette in her mouth speaking um, aristocratic twaddle were yeah. wonderfully funny yeah. and when Naya was with her they were like two terrible schoolgirls from the fourth form is it Naya took on a whole new personality with Nelly but those characters of of the Rhodeses with all their sort of aristocratic I won't say pretensions they're probably real um, uh, were part of the energy that underlay a lot of that patrician element in her work yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're in your hands, Roderick, so tell us what you want, and we'll do our best, all of us, to get it for you. Thank you, Lady Lacklander. Tahu Rhodes died quite young, and it was really Nellie that continued that relationship with Nio. And whenever Nio returned to England, she was the first person that Nio would see. And she wrote that. She thought about Nellie, there was never a day went past that she didn't think of her, even when they were, they were separated. And she was utterly, utterly de devastated uh, when, when Nellie died. And I think she lost part of herself. It was part of her history, part of the most exciting part of her youth. In a way, Alice in Wonderland had died. Of course the books were a way of making money. And that's what she used to say to her fashionable friends. She would sort of say, no, why are you slumming in this lowbrow field? And she would laugh in that jolly way that she had and put on that carapace of being above any kind of hurt. But deep down, she was very proud when the Mystery Writers of America gave her the Edgar Allan Poe Award for a lifetime achievement. The very valuable 1978 award, Naya Marsh for her detective thriller books, wonderful little face and something she was inordinately proud of.
Graham Greene and Georges Simenon and Agatha Christie and uh, Truman Capote, for goodness sake. Many major writers had received Edgars, as they're called, and no one in New Zealand, she said, would take any notice of it or think that her work meant anything. She got a great uh, Detective Fiction Award and they wanted to present it to her, uh, the Crime Club, and I think she invited me, would I accompany her to this great um, ceremony? And it, was t it took place in the great Garrick Club, which is the famous club for actors and lawyers. And we climbed the stairs with all the amazing portraits of everyone from Garrick through to Olivia, Guinness, Richardson, all smiling down at us. And we sat at this great long table. And there was a wonderful, uh, I can't remember very much about it, except that I was overawed and people like um, Harry Keating and uh, other great writers um, spoke wonderfully of her. She had her excellent ideas and she went for them, which is wonderful, and produced things that people were delighted with. But um, she didn't go deeply enough, to my mind, into all her characters and she didn't take enough interest in what the reader would feel. Um, and she more thought, I want to say this and I say it. Do you think her writing was somewhat stilted then? When she was gripped by one of her ideas, uh, it wasn't stilted, but when she had to connect the nice things she'd thought of saying one to another, uh, her writing did tend to plod a bit and be stilted until she'd managed to reach across to the next thing she really wanted to say. Peter, quite calmly, you threw the glove onto the fire. Well, Mr. Wilde, have I left anything out? Naya was developing characterization, and that really appealed to American readers in particular. I think this is where she could have gone much, much further. She did tend to stick to the narrow corsetry of the detection plot. And really, she was very, very interested in character. And I think often probably found them running away with her and had to kind of rein them back in to get the plot finished off. Um, you are. I don't think she produces such an in-depth uh, picture of you uh, as I present, for better or worse, of Goethe. Writing really does demand your full brain, heart, and whatever, and uh, I don't think she always did that. She did it at times, uh, but um, she didn't consistently do it from the start of a book to the last, the end. This is Montpellier Walk. This is the heart of Nyers London. This is Knightsbridge, where it all happened for her. This is where she stayed with, with Jonathan Elson. Yes. Um, when, when, when they were here together. She was writing her book, Hand and Glove, and, and he was actually at, 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 as a student at Lambda. She adored wrestling on television. <laughs> and on a Saturday afternoon, I remember there were two settees in this little house, and she would be reclining on one, and I would be on the other, and we would be watching the afternoons wrestling. And she would be shouting out and telling them to get him in that lock. The queens of crime, the four queens of crime, including Agatha Christie, they were all quite private people. I mean, the genre allowed them to be private because the detective novel allowed you to sort of not search your soul and put it on display. Yes. She sort of laid her own red herrings over her own life, I feel, because don't forget she did remove all those letters. It's editing out of loyalty. Yes. It's not about... Although you weren't asked to destroy yours, were you? Oh, good not. Uh, no, so I don't know. You may have something. Yeah. You may have something. That's, that's... I don't think she was a private person at all. She just went about her business. Her job mm. kept her away from the public, but uh, she was mm. out there. And... But no, I, I think do... it's a bit of a myth. That. I do think there is something from Victorian 
uh, inheritance of guarding your feelings. You must not impose your feelings on somebody else. But it doesn't mean that she didn't have those feelings of, de of depression, rejection that we all have. There were stories of there having been, I believe, a, a lover, or if not a lover, somebody who's very important in her life who she lost, I think, in the First World War, a well, young man in Flanders. And then later she did say to me that she lost a fiancé in the Wilkie Company days who died, and he obviously was in his early 20s. So I think she <clears throat> knew a great deal about grief and loss. Oh, I think so too. It's nice to have a soulmate, even if it's just for a short time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was never clear in her life that that mm -hmm. had happened. Mm -hmm. I think... A lot of us played a part role, you know. I think mean? that's very true. Yeah. That's true. Yes. And we, we had. I was one of the daughters of the house, you know. No doubt, you guys were the sons so of the house. Those boys, you know. Yes. I mean, there were so many dream children, weren't there? Yes. I mean, there were so many people who were ersatz sons and offspring. She loved Christmas. Oh, she loved Christmas, and so did all of us. She made it a wonderful, wonderful evening, and those children still talk about it now, although they're all ones I know in their 30s and 40s. But this party was their big event of the year. I was five years old, and we did a play, as the children used to every year as a way of thanking her, and I was Marjorie Daw, Seesaw Marjorie Daw. There was a huge Christmas tree, the biggest I'd ever seen, and it had real candles on it, real little candles attached to the branches. And then these boxes of toys, they were unbelievable. Large boxes, you know, this sort of size by this size, that had all been beautifully painted and decorated by Nio with ribbons, all different colours. And so I, my box was dark green with pink trimming. It had pink ribbon carefully glued in loops and swirls all around it. You'd ask for a cricket ball and you'd get a box of every cricketing item you could possibly want. I'd had this vision of her, you know, taking centre stage. I thought she was terribly beautiful with her silver white hair and she always had lipstick on and she always looked so elegant and she had that wonderful voice. She was the most generous, gracious person. Generous and gracious. Yes, indeed, ma'am. It was just lovely. Thank you, Nayo. One might wonder how this woman living way away from England and going back and forth every three or four years for so many months sustained this international career. Nayo had a very strong circle of women friends here in New Zealand. Some of them were widows, some of them were unmarried. And the very blokish, short back and sides 40s, 50s and 60s of New Zealand, pre-feminist. She needed a sheet anchor and she had these amazingly strong women, charge nurses at the hospital, matrons, uh, women of great cultivation and private means, unique, strong, passionate, cultivated New Zealand women living very marginalised in a blokish culture, a Barry Crump culture. Uh, and of course, um, Sylvia Fox. So we were actually New Arts and Margaret's, which was from 1910. So I guess arguably Sylvia was the longest um, friendship and often would have a luncheon or a meal at night with Naya and watch a bit of television and gossip or do the crossword together. So she had intimacy when she needed it, quite portable intimacy, and yet when she needed it, the drawbridge could go up and she could be again on her own here in this house. This is Dulwich College where um, Henry Marsh went to school with his brother and uh, it was one of the elite sort of private boys schools and Henry's father died. They were from a well-to-do family, he was one of ten children and it left them rather destitute and with a sort of upper middle class expectation and no money to, to sort of realise it. Nio had great expectations from the background that, that her father came from. Mm. And the lifestyle that was established in England was something that she tried to recapture her, her family history in her books. I think that what 
is absolutely key for Nao is that period between the wars when Nao spent a lot of time in England. She herself would have been about 25. She becomes part of a society in which so many men have been killed. This is where her friendships were made. This is where she belonged. She moved. Her friends were uh, members of the Rhodes family and Balfours and, and Plunkett's. These are very traditional English families, great families. And this was Nio's natural milieu. Uh, I think it was a milieu that her family belonged to before they went to New Zealand, but I don't think they had any money. Uh, and I think then that Nio's writing was very much part of helping her live that sort of life which she thought was really living. Oh, all this upset. Alfred's forgotten to fill my boxes. And it's too tiresome. I, I've mislaid my beautiful cigarette case. In oh, fact, right. you were created in this place. It was a trip to, to Dulwich College that inspired Nio to find the character for her detective in that fantastic youth that her father had, full of Englishness, full of expectation in that wonderful boys school. So, of course, um, Alan is an Elizabethan actor and this whole college is really a, a celebration of his contribution to this area. Are there any parallels between her life and her fiction? Many, many, Detective Inspector, and in fact you embody the greatest of them all. Mm. Because I really think that the two characters of yourself and your wife really represent different elements in her own psyche. After all, she had that masculine quality, she dressed in a masculine way, she had the strength and resilience that New Zealand women at the time were not expected to have, which one loosely calls masculine. And yet on the other hand, of course, she was a very gifted painter who didn't pursue that career and uh, could indeed have become uh, a form of Agatha Troy. Here comes witch number three. Sorry? Oh, you mean as in the three weird sisters? Not really, no. There's four of them. If you're playing a leading part, you instinctively feel that your character will be reflecting something quite crucial about the writer. And I instinctively felt doing that, that Nio Marsh must be, must be saying something uh, idealised about a part of herself. And that that's why she wrote it so clearly, or certainly it seemed very clear to me, that it was possibly her best self. I loved the idea of Troy, and I found her whole, our whole relationship, I should say, so intriguing because she was circumspect. She's a very careful woman, and he, of course, similarly, is a very circumspect man. But I loved that. I say, we will try again, won't we? I mean, dinner or something. Yes, that'd be nice. Perhaps next time you'll leave that serious suit at home. In a world where television characters particularly were becoming more and more uh, upfront and in your face, um, of course, that's very much the style of television now. I loved the idea of playing people who were absolutely the opposite to that and who would think very carefully before they spoke and were very polite to each other, mm -hmm. but for whom there were depths of unspoken feeling and, uh, and care about the world they lived in and right and wrong. You know, of course, that uh, Naya really had a long-term relationship with you. Mm. I mean, when you think about that, she didn't really introduce the character of Troy, which was herself, uh, until about the fourth or fifth novel, but then there were another 25 or so novels and short stories in which Troy occasionally makes an appearance. So I really think when you're tracing her mental life, she's actually invested in the plots. She's invested in that world. 
with you in a very, very deep way that many people wouldn't have understood when they said, oh, poor Naya, you know, she was a lonely person, she didn't have a marriage. Psychically, she did. She once said to me that she thought she would have been made a mannequin wife and she would not have liked that. She didn't think she would be a very good wife and she'd probably be like her mother. She would be all very, very anxious for any children. So she solved that psychological you know, need, really, by creating a, um, a marriage in the guise of fiction. I need you a cup of tea. I wish you'd drink it. What do you think of me? Ah. Uh, well, you're everything... Everything... Uh, again, unspokenly, that she could really wish for in as much as she would want a man... I would want a man who's, who's challenging, who's moral. He's a very moral, upright man, and she's a very moral upright woman mm. and so of course you're perfect from that point of view but also um, challenging and annoying in a way that uh, brings great humor to her relationship <laughs> the chief inspector I believe is her ideal husband um, she saw glimpses of him in I think Tahu Rhodes uh, and even later um, Lord Ballantrae, Sir Bernard Ferguson these distinguished men with a Oxbridge and often, as I say, a military or service background. She was much bigger than any box that you could stick her in. And really, her intimacies were the people yeah. here. Yeah. They also, they were her female friends, they were her male friends. She had a kind of orchestration of intimacy. Mm. Writing her biography, I found a complex woman who was much yeah. more interesting than a yeah. lesbian or a heterosexual or a, oh, God, yes. you know. Mm. I mean, what is romance? Um, it's more complicated than just something that lasts for five minutes and that's what she had in the friendships and the yeah. deep emotional connections she had with people. I didn't at the, at the time understand why she said to me mm. one night, I can't even remember what we were talking about, she said, I am not a lesbian. And I think what she was saying was that there was no label. She yes. didn't need any label. No, Don't you think that threesome thing is fascinating about Naya Marsh? Now, I'm not, I'm not putting a bad negative spin no, on this, okay. but, it, but she did have relationships with married couples that were utterly satisfying for her mm. because she had the male... Who, who added that sort of male kind of energy. And she, but she also, she also enjoyed the dual relationship. And I think, I can't help thinking that in a way that's the, the dual relationship she had in Troy and, Troy and Roderick. Yeah, exactly. because, because in a way it was the two sides of no, the male, the female, the can sort of... Can we use the word androgynous here? I think oh, we I can. think that's a good word to use. Yes, yeah. all the other labels. Yeah, absolutely. She used to call the mewlings in her letters Valanita darlings. Valanita, she would mm. compound them oh, as yeah, a composite really? as, yes, and Fred and Eve Page were Fred and Eve she yeah. compounded yeah, these couples did. you're quite right it's yeah. a very I think interesting it gets at the core of what Naya Marsh was because in some ways she was that composite herself she created it mm. in her characters she looked for it in her personal relationships mm. and it was the male female thing and it is androgynous both partners in those relationships were interesting, stimulating people. There was no weak link in the chain. So. Whatever relationship she had, you know, yeah. beyond that, she still uh, had that amazing, strong singularity. Nayo had a talent for intimacy. She had a talent for loving affection. She really did. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure all of us have had that experience of being close and special yeah. to yeah. her in her life. I have noticed this with charismatic people, that they can create this kind of very special bond. So a lot of people felt that they had a very special bond with Naya. I think this was part of her complexity too. This was, I think, a way of engaging with people, but not really giving too much away about her own self and her own feelings. And she was a very, very private person. I think a lot of people felt that they knew a lot about her, but they didn't really. She didn't want to be known. Can you go further than that? There's some aspect of her that she didn't want to share. She was perfectly happy sharing the persona that she had developed, 
which was rich, which was satisfying, which was most pleasing to the people who were intimately involved with her. And so, eventually, that persona became a defense. I think she really had a hidden self that she, whatever it may be, as Brian says, she saw no reason to let you in on it. For a contemporary audience, in a world where actually um, fantasy and historical fiction is growing in popularity, you look at them now with a certain sense of nostalgia. So what is nice about them is that they're not rose-tinted, and they show the warts and the, the foibles of characters that are absolutely genuine. These were, these were based on real life. Possibly the reason for the, the reissue of all of Niall Marsh's titles in omnibus editions is because they do present a reassuring read, and quite often critics talk about a reassuring read in disparaging terms, but I see absolutely nothing wrong with, it, with a reassuring read. Um, and especially in the world in which we live, which is anything but reassuring, I think people like to escape for a few hours to read a novel where they know order will be restored from chaos and all's well with the world at the end of the book. One of the things that's very interesting about Nayo's sort of sense of period is whether she was writing her own environment, a milieu that she knew, whether it was the country house or the, the cruise ship or, or whatever else it was. You know, that difference between writing comedy of manners and writing, you know, I think what she called her techery. And the reason why I think people should try them out now is that it's not about a group of pampered people who have no connection with the rest of the world. It's actually about the failure of certain sorts of society that creates environments where people are so obsessed with their social standing that they actually can't function and that pride is so important that it outweighs any other moral consideration. She always wrote about one character, or latterly two, with, with Troy as, as well as yourself. Um, and, you know, all uh, readers l love that. They, they love to get to know characters, that, you know, the inspector, his sidekick, all of that. The serial nature of the books makes them compulsive. The books are her survival, yes. aren't they? they are her her words, yes, they are her immortality. Yeah, yeah. And I think she was aware that, or hoped that that might be the case. Yes. How this woman flourished and energised and, and nurtured the careers of others yes. was what I found so amazing. Yes. And that is why I think she should be remembered. Why did Auden say that what will survive of us is love? Mm. And I think that mm. when I think of yeah. Naya. Somebody of the, of the genius and breadth of Naya, you can't pin that character down to a singularity of Springboard. She's, she's brought together happily and successfully a, a number of conflicting and entertaining and amusing and endearing qualities that come from goodness knows where mm. and the final totality of that is what Nio was um, to try and pin it down to a reality darling reality <laughs> I, I don't think you'll ever do it mm. a mystery woman in fact in some sense she broke them and perhaps without being glib, she was a slight mystery. All lovers young, all lovers must, consign to thee and come to dust. No exorciser harm thee, nor no witchcraft charm thee. Ghost unlaid forbear thee, nothing ill come near thee. Quiet consummation have, and renowned be thy grave.